Welcome everyone to another edition of White Horse Live. This afternoon is our 70th episode, coming to you live from White Horse Black Mountain, hosted as always by Bob Hinkle and co-produced by White Horse Black Mountain and Rad House Studio. We are pleased to bring back Omichi Music and Dr. Daniel Weiser, and he is joined today once again by violinist Tim Schwartz. And we're so pleased to have a live audience again for these shows. Thank you for making all that noise. How wonderful. All of us here at White Horse and Rad House Studio, thank you for viewing White Horse Live during the past year. You have been just about the only income we've been able to generate during the ongoing COVID restrictions. You have kept White Horse from going out of business. And for that, we are indeed grateful. Now, artists are still faced with fewer and smaller audiences than before COVID. They, too, are grateful for your ticket purchases and for any additional love you might be willing to share by way of our virtual tip jar. During the show, you can visit whitehorselive.tips in your web browser or from your phone if you're here in the audience. And we'll display that address again from time to time during the show for our online audience. Thank you for helping make the series a success. Please help us spread the word, share the event notices, and tell all your friends. Now here's your host, Bob Hinkle. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to White Horse Live, episode number 70. God, I can't believe it. Now, Amici Music has, uh, has, as part of what it wants to do in life, the idea of promulgating good, wonderful chamber music in places that don't normally get it. And we're one of those. So we have to maintain our normal order of things by having a little theme song, which is not quite along the same lines as Beethoven, but you'll see what I mean. When the song rises up, white horses will fill the mountains. When the song rises up, then the clouds roll away. You don't believe that music has power. Just stay right here with us. For just about an hour, uh, Tim and Dan, they're going to lift you up. They're going to loosen up your tightening. and they will fill your cup when the song rises up. White horses will fill the mountains when the song rises up. Then the clouds roll away. Then the clouds roll away. Then the clouds, they're going to roll away. Woo. All right. Thank you. Now, it's true that... Uh, Dr. Daniel Weiser has played here at Whitehorse Black Mountain literally hundreds of times in the last 11 years. Um, Dan's company, Amici Music, has uh, been an integral part of our menu here. Uh, he and his beautiful family have actually lived around here for a few years until they moved to Baltimore. I can't understand leaving Asheville for a place such as Baltimore where they have such strange laws. Now, these are actual real true laws. and. and Baltimore and the surrounding area. It is illegal in Baltimore to take a lion to the movies. Can't make this up. Got to wonder about that one. Uh, it is necessary to document any services in the Baltimore area performed by a jackass. <laughs> I hope they got lots of typists in City Hall. Uh, <clears throat> it is illegal to mistreat oysters in the Baltimore area. Uh, you cannot keep chickens in your hotel room with you either. Uh, then my two favorites. Uh, it is illegal for a woman to go through her husband's pockets while he's asleep. <laughs> and my very favorites. It is illegal to sell condoms from vending machines there, except in places where alcoholic beverages are sold for consumption on the premises. <laughs> go figure. Those folks have been eating too many crab cakes. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Weiser, uh, seriously, he's played all over the world, Carnegie Hall, National Gallery in Washington, D.C. He's got more wonderful credits than I have time to read. Um, but for a price, I'll read them all, Dan, if you've got a couple of dollars on you. Um, if you don't like Beethoven, boy, are you in trouble in the wrong place today. We're going to get a good dose of Ludwig's sonatas as well as stories of his life. All this in an open bar. So, without further ado, here's the man, the man of few words, Dr. Daniel Weiser. Woo! 
All right. Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you to Rebecca and Brad House Studios for uh, doing the live stream. Always great to be back at the White Horse, uh, and uh, wonderful to be there doing their 70th performance of their live stream as they have kept this business going uh, through the pandemic. And now we have a wonderful live audience. It's so great to uh, hear a little applause, and we hope we'll uh, keep building and uh, be back here for uh, full live audiences in the very near future. Uh, today, uh, again, I'm here with Tim Schwartz, great colleague and friend. We were at Peabody Conservatory together many years back, uh, became uh, wonderful friends through music, mostly American music. We sort of uh, uh, specialized in that. Uh, we were known as the Upper Valley Duo, performed all over, and actually won the great uh, Artistic Ambassador Competition of 1996, sent by the U.S. government all through the Middle East and Southeast Asia, uh, performing concerts in 11 countries, including Syria and Pakistan and Thailand and Sri Lanka. Just an incredible tour, and uh, we're still friends, which is always amazing after you go through a tour like that. Uh, but uh, we are really excited now to do a part two of the uh, almost complete Beethoven Violin Sonatas. Hopefully you were with us last night. We did Sonatas number one, four, and five. Uh, if you couldn't be there, I think you can uh, see that again if you go to the White Horse uh, um, website and uh, chart that, uh, that concert. Uh, but today we're going to do his middle period, uh, the meat of his uh, sonatas, sonatas six, seven, and eight. And these were all actually written at the same time in October of 1802. Or, uh, 1802. They kind of poured out of Beethoven's head. Uh, and these are really considered the first of his romantic period sonatas. Uh, we can say that those other ones were at the late classical period, right at the turn of the century. Uh, but uh, things were changing not only for Beethoven personally, uh, but all through Europe, as Napoleon had begun to invade and the, the German Romantic poets and the English Romantic poets, there was a feeling in the air uh, that things were changing, that the whole social order well, was going to change. And in fact, there's a beautiful writing by E.T.A. Hoffmann, uh, who was a, also a composer, an artist, and a writer. Um, and he loved Beethoven's music, and he heard that it was something new was happening. He said the following, Through the sounds of his music, we are brought into the presence of the highest and the holiest of things, of the spiritual power that kindles the spark of life in the whole of nature. Uh, and he also said, Haydn's music, music reminds us of a blissful, eternally youthful life before the fall, while Beethoven's music sets in motion the lever of fear, of awe, of horror, of suffering and awakens just that infinite longing, which is the essence of romanticism. Uh, and Beethoven also felt the same way. He once wrote, music is the mediator between the spiritual and the sensual life. It is a higher revelation than all wisdom and philosophy. It is the one incorporeal entrance into the higher world of knowledge, which comprehends mankind, but which mankind cannot comprehend. Now, uh, personally, things were really at a, at a crux for Beethoven by this time. Uh, in 1800, uh, we get the first inkling uh, of his deafness. Uh, he had started to slowly lose his hearing around 1799, but he writes a letter in June of 1800 to a good friend back in Bonn, uh, and, uh, who had become a doctor, Franz Wegler, and he says the following. First, he sort of talks about his life. He said, you desire to know something of my position here in Vienna. Well, it is by no means bad. My compositions are very profitable, and I may say that I have almost more commissions than it is possible for me to execute. I can have six or seven publishers or more for every piece. If I choose, they no longer bargain with me. I demand, and they pay. But that malicious demon, bad health, has been a stumbling block in my path. My hearing during the last three years has become gradually worse. My ears are buzzing and ringing perpetually, day and night. I can say with truth that my life is very wretched. For two years now, I have avoided all society because I find it impossible to say to, me, to people, I am deaf. In any other profession, this might be more tolerable, but in mine, such a condition is truly frightful. Besides, what would my enemies say to this? And they are not few in number. Uh, and he goes on uh, a few months later, November, uh, continues with this. He said, um, you should then see me as happy as I am ever destined to be here below. Not unhappy. No, that I could not endure. I will boldly meet my fate 
Never shall it succeed in crushing me. It is glorious to live one's life a thousand times over. I feel that I am no longer made for a quiet existence. I don't think Beethoven was ever meant for a quiet existence, but already you can feel it bubbling up. And uh, his doctors said, well, maybe you should spend a summer in a nice quiet place outside of the noise of the city. And so he heads to this little village of Heiligenstadt, which is now sort of a, a suburb of, of Vienna. Uh, and he enjoys the countryside. He always loved being out in nature. Uh, and it is there uh, that he really contemplates what his next step in life is. Is he going to just pity himself like in these letters about how wretched life is, or is he going to attack life and do something with it? And of course, he'll choose the latter, but we'll see how it's not an easy decision. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, during this period, uh, he begins uh, to worry, uh, and uh, his friend, uh, Ferdinand Ries, who was with him, uh, said, as, uh, wrote about this. He said, I called his attention one day to a shepherd who was piping very agreeably in the woods on a flute made of a twig of elder. For half an hour, Beethoven could hear nothing, and though I assured him it was the same with me, which was, of course, not the case, he became extremely quiet and morose. When he occasionally seemed to be merry, it was generally to the extreme of boisterousness, but this seldom happened. Um, but what we're going to see is that in the three sonatas he writes, only the middle one, uh, the seventh one, which we'll do second, is really sort of like the, the fate, grabbing fate. Uh, the, the first one has a really sort of bucolic and quiet uh, feeling about it. Uh, and he begins to explore this new idea, rather than having a long melodic theme, uh, the tune in this thing is made up of a small little atom. Sounds like this. And from that two measures that starts this piece, he is able to sort of evoke uh, all sorts of different places. He uses that uh, building block in, in different ways, which was a whole new way of seeing music. Mozart and Haydn had built long four measure phrases and melodies, uh, but this not always beautiful melodies. That's not what we think about Beethoven, but it's the amazing structure, how he puts it all together. Out of this little atom comes amazing things. Um, there's a, an incredibly beautiful second movement, and there's a wonderful uh, quote from uh, the Hungarian violinist Jelly Deranyi about this movement. Uh, she said, the adagio of the sixth sonata is a great favorite of mine. The blend of the two instruments is so perfect. The whole movement has such a feeling of tenderness and sorrow that it reminds me, if I am allowed the comparison, to Michelangelo's Pietà and his unfinished marble, The Descent of the Cross. I do not want to suggest that the adagio could be called religious music. I am only thinking in both cases of the expression of infinite tenderness and sorrow, whether put into sound or carved into stone. Uh, and then the last movement is actually not the original movement that he wrote for this piece. Uh, if you're with us tomorrow, uh, you're going to hear the Kreutzer Sonata. And what Beethoven wrote uh, originally for this is the movement that he later put, the last movement of the Kreutzer Sonata, which is a much more fiery piece. And he must have realized that it didn't seem to work well with the first and second movements, which are a quieter, more gentler piece. So he shelved that uh, movement and then picked it up uh, a couple of years later and put it with the Kreutzer, where it actually fits much better. And instead, he chose a beautiful little theme in variations, uh, which really seems to complement this piece much better. So I hope you enjoy uh, Sonata number six, Opus 30, number one in A major.
It's a really wonderful A major uh, sonata. Again, not the most often played, but lots of really quirky parts to that. It's a beautiful slow movement. Um, so now we get to the seventh sonata. This is in the key of C minor. And when Beethoven wanted to really do something special, he always went to the key of C minor. Uh, if we think of the pathetic sonata, the great uh, piano sonata, uh, which was really sort of uh, sorry, his first great romantic work, that was in C minor. And then a couple of years after this would come uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, again in C minor. That to him was the key of fate, uh, the key that really had everything in it. Uh, and so he chose that uh, for the, the seventh sonata in C minor here. Uh, and I want to read now a little bit from uh, what is now known as the Heiligenstadt Testament. This was a letter uh, that he supposedly wrote to his brothers while he was in Heiligenstadt describing uh, the horrors of his deafness and uh, how he was uh, really contemplating putting an end to it. Um, now, he never sent this letter and it was discovered after he died and it seems pretty certain that Beethoven wanted history to see this letter, uh, to know what he was going through at this time so that we could understand the change that was about to happen, this new uh, outpouring of romantic feeling uh, and why he had to grab fate uh, this way in order to get through life. So I'll read a little bit. This is written in o October 6, 1802, right as he's uh, writing all of these sonatas. Uh, he says, uh, Dear brothers, for the last six years, I have been afflicted with an incurable complaint, which has been made worse by incompetent doctors. From year to year, my hopes of being cured have gradually been shattered. And finally, I have been forced to accept the prospect of a permanent infirmity the curing of which may perhaps take years or may even prove to be impossible. Though endowed with a passionate and lively temperament and even fond of the distractions offered by society, I was soon obliged to seclude myself and live in solitude. If at times I decided just to ignore my infirmity, alas, how cruelly was I then driven back by the intensified sad experience of my poor hearing. Yet I could not bring myself to say to people, speak up, shout, for I am deaf. How could I possibly refer to the impairing of a sense which in me should be more perfectly developed than in other people? A sense which at one time I possessed in the greatest perfection, even to a degree of perfection such as assuredly few in my profession possess or have ever or will ever possess. I cannot do it, so forgive me if you see me withdrawing from your company, which I used to enjoy. Moreover, my misfortune pains me doubly, inasmuch as it leads to my being misjudged. For me, there can be no relaxation in human society, no refined conversations, no mutual confidences. I must live quite alone and can creep into society only as often as sheer necessity demands. I must live like an outcast. If I appear in company, I am overcome by a burning anxiety, a fear that I am running the risk of letting people notice my condition. How humiliated I have felt if somebody standing beside me heard the sound of a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or if somebody heard a shepherd sing and again, I heard nothing. Such experiences almost made me despair, and I was on the point of putting an end to my life. The only thing that held me back was my art, for indeed it seemed to me impossible to leave this world before I had produced 
all the works that I felt the urge to compose, and thus I have dragged on this miserable existence, this truly miserable existence. So that's how Beethoven was feeling uh, in this year. Um, but at the same time, later in this letter, uh, he does write, I shall have to grapple with fate. It shall never pull me down. And then later he wrote, I live only in my music. I have scarcely begun one thing when I start another. So even at the height of his self-pity of the horror of what was going on, he then just uh, sort of moved everything around and said, this is my time. I will withdraw from society, live for my music alone, and from this pours out uh, so many great works. The Eroica, the Third Symphony, would come in 1803, the Fifth Symphony, the Sixth Symphony, Seventh, Ninth, of course, uh, and all of this other wonderful music, the Waldstein, Appassionata, Piano Sonatas, all in this period from about 1803 to 1812, what we call his heroic or middle period. Um, so we're going to get to this wonderful Seventh Sonata. Now, like the Fifth Sonata yesterday, this sonata has four movements. And like I said yesterday, uh, to write a sonata in four movements was sort of uh, trying to make it more like a symphony. Symphony was traditionally a four-movement piece by this time, but sonatas were considered three movements, a lighter sort of piece. But here Beethoven adds this little scherzo movement. It's longer than the one from the Fifth Symphony. Uh, still a very a short little joke movement. Uh, he has the beautiful second slow movement, as always, a tumultuous uh, last movement. Uh, the first movement really is sort of the epic, uh, and it's got one of the great endings of all time, where the pianist uh, basically gets tendonitis uh, trying to play the end of this. Um, but uh, it is uh, filled with the drama, also filled with this kind of little military uh, sound to it. And again, we have to remember that this is at the time when Napoleon is taking over Europe, and actually Napoleon and the French troops occupy Austria at different times. And so there were troops all around in this military sound, and it reminds me of one of my favorite uh, quotes um, uh, written by Thomas Pynchon about the music of Beethoven. He said, this is from Gravity's Rainbow, a person feels good listening to Rossini, but all you feel like after listening to Beethoven is going out and invading Poland. Um, <laughs> and in many ways, this is one piece where you do want to invade Poland after you hear it, uh, but it is so filled with drama and intensity, uh, like a string about to snap. Here's the seventh sonata in C minor, opus 30, number two.
really get the essence of the power of Beethoven. Uh, two instruments uh, making a lot of noise. Uh, really sort of a preview of what's to come uh, tomorrow uh, and a few years later in Beethoven's life when we uh, finish up uh, and uh, start tomorrow with his epic Kreutzer Sonata, which is truly a basically a double concerto for violin and piano uh, as the two instruments sort of uh, have a fight, uh, sort of a duel almost, uh, who can uh, outdo the other one. Uh, and it's a, just a fascinating uh, piece uh, which has become sort of a, uh, a Tolstoy took it up uh, in, a, in a novel called the Kreutzer Sonata. Other musicians have looked back on it. Uh, it's really an epical piece and uh, one uh, you really need to join us tomorrow at two o'clock to see that. And then the final one piece that he wrote, a quirky little uh, piece uh, from 1815, so later in his life, uh, but really shows Beethoven exploring whole new realms uh, as he uh, reached uh, uh, in a new period in his life where he moved away from this very dramatic fate style towards one that's very modern, even sounds modern to our ears and uh, sort of uh, almost d disintegrates music as he's writing it. So a fascinating uh, finish to the story tomorrow. Uh, but today we're going to finish uh, with, uh, again, a lighter piece, again, written at the right at the same time. But Beethoven was able to make these emotional switches very quickly uh, from something that uh, sounds like fate knocking at the door uh, to a much more lighter piece in the, the Sonata in G major, uh, eight, uh, Sonata number 8, Opus 30, number 3. Um, just a lovely little piece. Uh, it starts off a first movement uh, with a, a, just a scale pattern arpeggio. Uh, suddenly we're sort of in a, a much uh, happier uh, uh, town folk scene as we're dancing. Um, very light, uh, very village kind of countryside sort of uh, music. Uh, there's the second movement is kind of interesting because it's a minuet, uh, so we get this sort of dance-like feel. Uh, but there's a moment in the middle, I'll try and demonstrate now, where uh, the violin's playing the beautiful minuet, and below there's a little oom pa in the bass, boom, chop, chop, boom, chop, chop, and it feels like it should work, but he puts, uh, Beethoven always put the accents in the wrong place, so normally you'd have the emphasis on the first beat, uh, but Beethoven here uh, explores the accent on the second beat, so it's like somebody who can't dance, uh, and I'll just play it for you. Uh, here we go. So here's, uh, the violin's playing this... a lovely melody, and below, what should sound like this. But instead, here's what Beethoven writes. It's really hard to play, because all the beats are in the wrong place. Uh, but uh, it's really sort of fascinating, Beethoven just uh, sort of laughing, in a sense, at, uh, at these people and enjoying himself. And then, uh, right, he follows it up with a third movement uh, with a very simple, uh, sort of, the, it's almost a drone. You almost hear bagpipes in the bass. It's very much a folk, folk tune. And he keeps coming back to the same little tune that starts it off. Uh, but again, in the middle of that, it really feels like some, a drinking song, that we're in a bar and just having a great time. So it's really wonderful to see Beethoven be able, uh, within a couple weeks of writing, uh, to move from that piece where it sounds like it's the end of the world, that he's about to give up and just uh, throw himself away in the river. Uh, and then he comes back. Uh, and that's what makes Beethoven so wonderful. So we hope you enjoy uh, the G Major Sonata, Opus 30, number 3.
Thank you all very much. Again, whitehorselive.tips. Thank you to Bob. Thank you, Rebecca and Rat House. We'll see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Tim. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. As usual. Don't tell him I said so. He'll want more money. All right. Let's kind of go out the way we came in. When the song rises up. White houses are filled with mountains. When the sun rises up, then the clouds roll away. Sisters, ain't you glad to feel that fear fading? Brothers, ain't you glad they're going to be a better day? People, ain't you glad that we're all in this together? But people, ain't you glad that the clouds going to roll away? When the sun rises up, white houses are filled with mountains. When the sun rises up, then the clouds roll away. Well, Daniel and Tim, they were the vessel here this time. I hope that you enjoyed it, maybe had a glass of wine, and I uh, hope that you were able to let go of yourself, and I hope we helped you take your jaw down off the shelf when the song rises up. White horses feel the mountains when the song rises up. Then the clouds roll away, then the clouds roll away, then the clouds. They're going to roll away. All right. Thank you. Now, this has been a very high-level performance. It's been all, it's, you know, it's been wonderful music. It's been, you had to use your brains and stuff, and I think, so we got to sign off with some of the, maybe some of the worst music jokes that I could find. What do you think? Like, why are pianos so hard to open? Because all the keys are inside. Definition of a piano, it's a cumbersome piece of furniture found in many homes where playing it ensures the early departure of unwanted guests. And how about this one? Why is an organ concert like a religious experience? Well, it's, in its playing, we sense the majesty of God. In its ending, we know of God's divine mercy. I can't listen to Wagner, as Daniel said, it makes me want to invade Poland. A youngster came, this is just the last one, so don't, don't do it. A uh, youngster came home from school one day and was having dinner with his parents and some of their friends. And his father asked him, so son, why did you learn in school? And the young fellow said, we were studying the classical composers. And I learned that Johann Sebastian Bach had 22 children and he practiced on the spinster upstairs. <laughs> Take care of each other, drive safe, don't try and drink your wine with your mask on. It'll be messy. Take care of each other. Good night now. Thanks for joining us for White Horse Live. This program is produced by White Horse Black Mountain and by Rad House Studio. Bob Hinkle is your host and executive producer. Claire Hoke is audio engineer. Jessica Wharton is director of photography. Jessica Fox is key grip, front of house engineer, and tonight's engineer. 
Public Relations Services, provided by Maggie Rainwater at Hoosier Devil. And I'm Rebecca Hillgraves, director and producer for these programs. We'll be back tomorrow afternoon with another great performance from Amici Music and White Horse Live. And we have a concert tonight of bluegrass music, if you like to uh, change things up about 180 degrees. In the meantime, be good to each other, and that includes all people. <laughs>